In part one of The Seventh Day, Hal Holbrook and guest experts faced the issues of origins. Are we the unplanned and accidental result of evolution through natural selection? Or are we the handiwork of a supreme being? Do we owe our existence to the Aztec or Babylonian gods? Or to some alien creatures from outer space? What is the truth about our origin? When was our universe born? How did the stars find their places? Science can talk about how the universe behaves, how things take place within the universe. It cannot explain why something exists rather than nothing. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. God creates the entire world in six days, and then he rests on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is, though, a creation in and of itself, because what it does is put the rest of the six days in perspective. The commandment to observe the Sabbath every seventh day, the longest of all the Ten Commandments, was preserved with the other nine on stone tablets and placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Individuals today are in great need of finding a sanctuary in time, which is what the Sabbath is. Pope John Paul II, in his apostolic letter, Dies Domini, suggests that the Sabbath recalls that the universe and history belong to God. In more than 100 ancient and modern languages, the seventh day of the week was named Sabbath, or its equivalent. As we increase our knowledge of the past, as we unravel its mysteries, the outlines of our history become more and more distinct. From caves and burial sites, from stony cliffs that were once cities and towns, from the wrecks and ruins of long-lost tribes and nations, there emerge new clues to broaden our understanding of the human story. From the records of extinct civilizations and societies, and from the volumes of ancient literature, archaeologists are continually adding to the picture. There is a day that sets the weekly structure of time and binds the human family to its beginnings, the seventh day Sabbath that links us to the Creator. And now, part two of the seventh day, revelations from the lost pages of history. In the time when Jesus Christ walked among the Jews, it was his custom to attend the synagogue to worship and teach on the Sabbath day. And the eyes of the religious leaders were continually upon him. Some of the rabbis of his day argued with him over the proper way to observe the Sabbath. They waited to see if he would heal people on the holy day so they might accuse him of breaking the Sabbath.
Hello, I'm Hal Holbrook. Welcome to part two of the seventh day, Revelations from the Lost Pages of History. What Jesus Christ did on that Sabbath 2,000 years ago was revolutionary indeed. By healing on that day, he won the hearts of the common people. This placed him in direct conflict with the Jewish leaders. By claiming himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath, he challenged their spiritual authority, a challenge that eventually led to his infamous trial and death on the cross. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, an insignificant town in the region of Judea, during the reign of Caesar Augustus, the first great Roman emperor. At that time, the Roman Empire held within its borders scores, if not hundreds, of religions and cults. From Zoroastrianism in Persia, to the mystery cults of Greece, to the Druidism of Celtic Britain. Secret initiations and fertility rites were common, and so was belief in astrology. The Romans themselves admired the religion and culture of Greece, they adopted Greek gods and blended them into their own religions. The result was a mixture of ancestor worship, emperor worship, and sun worship, a religion that included not one god, but many. The Jews, on the other hand, worshipped only one god. Though surrounded by the images of Greek and Roman deities, they served a god they couldn't see. They had no icons or images to represent him. They had no initiations or fertility rites. Instead, they had a day, a day that set them apart, a day without equal in any other religion, a 24-hour period devoted completely to their god. The Jews had the Sabbath. After the exodus from Egypt, God made a covenant with Israel. And part of that covenant included the Ten Commandments with the commandment to keep the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, as a memorial of his creation and of his redemption from Egypt. By keeping that Sabbath, which was a sign between God and Israel, they were reminded that he was their God and they were his people. You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It's safe to assume that the Jews of the first century knew and read the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments told them, just as it tells us, that the Sabbath is a memorial to God's creation of the world in six days, and also is a memorial to the Exodus from Egypt. For Jews of the first century, the Sabbath was a time of intense spirituality. They related to God who created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh, so they too rested on the seventh. As well in Jewish liturgy, they reflected on the fact that God took them out of Egypt, so the Sabbath became for them a celebration of their freedom. Observance of the seventh-day Sabbath was the unmistakable mark of a Jew. It set him apart from everyone else. It, it couldn't be hidden. In the eyes of Greek and Roman observers, the Jewish observance of the Sabbath was one of the peculiarities of the Jews. Here is a people that does not work every seventh day, and the Greeks and Romans had nothing comparable to this. First century Jews took advantage of the Sabbath in that they couldn't work and instead rejoiced. They would have a wonderful candlelit dinner on Friday night. Uh, often with two loaves of bread to commemorate the manna that fell in the desert in the biblical period. Uh, they would on Saturday probably attend the synagogue where they had the opportunity to see and perhaps gossip with their friends. And from the evidence that we have, they studied the Torah and worshiped together. Outside observers are repeatedly struck by the oddity of the Jewish refusal to do work on the Sabbath day. Uh, one philosopher, Seneca, even says that the Jews devote one-seventh of their life to idleness because they don't work on the Sabbath day. 
When Jesus arrived on the scene, the Sabbath was being crushed under the weight of arbitrary rules and regulations. The rabbis had turned Sabbath keeping into a meticulous science, devoid of meaning and joy. In the first century, Sabbath observance was a series of don'ts. Uh, they forbade the tying or untying of a knot. Cooking. Writing more than one letter of the alphabet. The carrying of any burden, including something you might put in your pocket. And a lot of the day-to-day -day kind of work, like preparing skins and hides and the things that you would need for subsistence. They forbade the uh, kindling of a fire or the extinguishing of a fire. And they forbade travel of more than 2,000 cubits beyond your dwelling place. 2,000 cubits would be about uh, 4,000 feet. The Jewish way of Sabbath keeping was very legalistic. You couldn't move, you couldn't do anything. But Jesus saw that that was a distortion of God's plan for humanity. By healing the man with the withered hand, Jesus showed the true spirit of the Sabbath. He rejected the rabbi's rules. He kept the Sabbath as taught in the ancient Hebrew scriptures. According to the Gospel of Luke, it was Jesus' custom to go into the synagogue and worship on the Sabbath day. He did keep the Sabbath, but he did not keep it according to the rules laid down by the Pharisees. In fact, he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Whereas the Pharisees had said that the Sabbath was made only for Israel, and in fact, Israel was made for the Sabbath so that the Lord would have someone on earth to keep the Sabbath. When Jesus declared that the Sabbath was made for man, he was teaching a radical, disturbing concept. No wonder he provoked such strong opposition from the Jewish leaders. On another Sabbath, Jesus was teaching the people. And there was a woman who had been ill and bent over for 18 years. And he called her to him. leaders were angry with Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, and they continued to conspire against him. To the religious leaders, this was scandalous behavior, particularly because it broke their mortal danger rule. The mortal danger rule said that there were some things you could do on the Sabbath only in life or death cases. You could save someone whose life was in danger, but you could not heal a chronically ill person on the Sabbath. That would have to wait for another day. But Jesus didn't want to wait another day. He was saying basically, you untie your animal so that your animal can rest on the Sabbath, but you are criticizing me for loosing this woman from her burden so that she can truly keep Sabbath for the first time in many, many years. It was a devastating argument. St. John, in his record of the life of Jesus, reports that for this reason the Jews were persecuting Jesus 
because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. They accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, and they were afraid that the people would follow Jesus, the nation would become a nation of Sabbath breakers, and this would incur the judgments and the wrath of God, and they would lose their nation. And it was this fear that led to the crucifixion of Christ. Some have suggested that the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments lost its significance with the life and death of Jesus, that somehow he did away with the Sabbath. When he said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, he could have said the Sabbath was given to Israel and is no longer necessary for people other than Israelites to keep, and maybe not even Israelites. He had all kinds of opportunities to say, the Sabbath isn't important, let's get rid of the Sabbath. But instead, all the controversies that he had with the Pharisees were not about whether the Sabbath should be kept, but how it should be kept. If ever there was a question about how to keep the Sabbath, Jesus gave the answer. The, the answer was the authority of the sacred scriptures, not following the human laws and traditions. The human had so encrusted the Sabbath, you could hardly see the, the real thing. Jesus cut through that to the heart of the Sabbath, which is a relationship between a loving creator and, and, and people. And so Sabbath, away from the secular activities, could be a day of, of, of action and day of concern for your fellow beings, and day for fellowship, and day to spend more time with God, your family, your neighbors, your friends. Many devout Christians are surprised to learn that their own weekly day of worship is based on church rules and traditions, and not on the sacred scriptures. Some believe the Bible teaches that Jesus purposefully violated the seventh day Sabbath in order to make way for a new Christian day of worship. This idea lacks both biblical and historical support. Jesus didn't break the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments. What he did was to defy human customs and traditions, and by doing that, he showed what the biblical Sabbath keeping, the true Sabbath keeping, really was. Jesus Christ broke the Sabbath free, free from the traditions that had made it a rigid formality and he restored its true purpose as a celebration of man's relationship with his fellow man and with his creator. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. With those words, Jesus pointed to a frightening prediction from the Old Testament prophet Daniel. But why would he tell the people to pray that they wouldn't have to escape on the Sabbath, unless he expected them to still be keeping the Sabbath holy? In the Roman Empire in the year 66, Rome was quite unstable. That's called the year of the four emperors, and the first three did not die of natural causes. So the Jews, an eastern province of the Roman Empire, thought that this was actually a good time to take advantage of Roman instability to press forward for their own freedom from Roman oppression. The Roman general Vespasian marched against the city in an attempt to quell the uprising. Before the job was done, he became emperor in 69 AD. And his son Titus, another future emperor, took over as general of the army. Titus laid siege to the city, and finally in 70 AD, the Roman army broke through the defenses, ravaged the city, and completely destroyed the temple. An early church historian reports that the Christians of Jerusalem remembered the warning of Jesus and escaped before the city fell to the Romans. This story is an obvious intersection of history and prophecy. We know the dates and places, and Jesus predicted 
and knew when these things would take place, that 40 years after his death and resurrection, his followers would still be keeping the Sabbath. In fact, throughout the New Testament period, and that takes us to the end of the first century A.D., Christians continued to observe the seventh-day Sabbath. That's clear from both the biblical and historical records. Uh, the early Christians saw the relation to Judaism not as a kind of a discontinuity, but as a progression. In fact, their religion was the fulfillment of all the hopes and expectations of the Old Testament. Christians did not see themselves as a new religion. They believed that they were Jews. They were the true Israel. They were the children of Abraham. If they were Gentiles, they were the children of Abraham by faith. One thing that Jews and Christians shared was an idea that God acts in history, that he acted at Sinai, uh, at the Exodus, at creation. And the record of those actions is in the Hebrew scriptures. The belief in the one God, a personal God, a loving creator in relationship with his creatures, this was at the heart of both Jewish and Christian theology. It was also at the heart of the experience of Sabbath keeping for, for them as a relationship with a loving creator. But for Christians, the life and death of Christ added a new dimension, a new reason for Sabbath keeping. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. With those words, St. Paul showed that Christian faith took the Sabbath to new heights. With the death and resurrection of Jesus, Christians had a new hope a hope of deliverance from a world of sin. And the Sabbath, originally the memorial of creation, now also commemorated salvation and the spiritual peace that it brings. This brings us to an intriguing question. If the first century Christians observed the Sabbath of the Old Testament, the seventh day Sabbath of creation and the fourth commandment, why do most Christians today observe Sunday? When did the change from Saturday to Sunday take place? Does the biblical record provide any clue? The first four books of the New Testament are among the oldest Christian documents. St. Mark wrote his book first, a report on the life of Christ. That was 55 AD or later. The writings of Saints Matthew and Luke probably date to sometime between the late 60s and AD 80. St. John, the last surviving original disciple of Christ, wrote his book near the end of the first century. Despite their late dates, from 30 to 70 years after the death of Christ, these books contain not even the slightest hint that Jesus himself or his disciples considered changing the day of rest and worship from the seventh day of the week to the first. It's especially significant that New Testament writers never refer to the first day of the week as the Sabbath. To them, the seventh day was the Sabbath. And this is consistent with all of the other evidence that to the end of the first century, Christians were worshiping with Jews in the synagogue on the Sabbath. About 95 or 100 AD, a change was made in the synagogue service. The middle part of the service is known as the standing prayer, the Amidah, or the 18 benedictions, consisting of 18 short prayers or blessings of God, thanksgiving blessings. All 18 are recited on weekdays, on Sabbaths only seven. But at this time, an additional one was added. It's known in Hebrew as the Birkat Hamanim, the blessing concerning the heretics, but it's not really a blessing. May the apostates have no hope. May the dominion of wickedness be speedily uprooted in our day. May the Nazarenes and the heretics quickly perish and not be inscribed together with the righteous. Blessed art thou, the eternal our God, who crushes the wicked. Amen. 
it smoked out the Christians because anyone could be asked to lead out in the recitation of this. Anybody, or everybody was supposed to say amen at the end of each one. And, and this made it very uncomfortable, in fact, impossible for Christians to participate in the, uh, the, the Pharisee-led synagogue service from that time onward. The evidence of this synagogue prayer helped sharpen our picture of first century Christians. It's clear that they were keeping the Sabbath right along with their Jewish brothers. So now the Jews were becoming less tolerant of Christians, but Christians themselves were beginning to question the value of their connection to Judaism. In the early church literature, Christians are really desperate to separate from Judaism and to distinguish themselves. As a result, there is the appearance of a great deal of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. Some of it is invective, nasty comments about Jews. Some of it is pushing away from what they saw as Old Testament religion. There were practical reasons for the Christians to distance themselves from the Jews. No doubt they were swept up in the current of anti-Jewish sentiment. Not surprising given the level of conflict between Jews and the Roman Empire at the time. Although the Jews were scattered throughout the Mediterranean region and beyond, many of them still dreamed of a great Jewish nation and ultimate victory over their enemies. And in North Africa around 115 AD, these dreams flared into violence. The Jews in the region of Cyrene had put a certain Andreas at their head and were destroying both the Romans and the Greeks. Many they sawed in two, from the head downwards. Others they gave to the wild beasts, and still others they forced to fight as gladiators. In all, 220,000 persons perished. In Egypt, too, they perpetrated many similar outrages, and in Cyprus, Dio Cassius. A few years later, in 132, Jewish opposition to imperial authority exploded into another violent revolt. This time, it was in Jerusalem. Our ancient sources give us two reasons for the Bar Kochva uprising. First, a prohibition by the uh, Roman Emperor Hadrian, a prohibition against circumcision. The Jews would no longer be allowed to practice circumcision. Second, the decision by the Emperor Hadrian to rebuild Jerusalem as a pagan city, the city of Ilia Capitolina. Imperial forces finally crushed the rebellion in 135. Hadrian banned Jews from Jerusalem and prohibited Sabbath keeping and other Jewish rites of religion. So there was strong anti-Jewish sentiment throughout the Roman Empire. Jews were the enemy. Christians didn't want to be associated with the Jews and thought of as the enemy. And the easy way to disassociate themselves was to renounce the Sabbath, which was a mark of Jewishness. So where and when did Christians first begin to observe an alternate day of worship? The lost pages of history lead us in a surprising direction. Alexandria, Egypt, founded in 332 BC by Alexander the Great, one of the world's great centers of literature, science, and commerce, a melting pot of religious ideas and classical philosophy. There is solid evidence that Christians in Alexandria were the first to replace Sabbath observance with first day, that is Sunday, worship. This began shortly before 120 A.D. One of the first documents that we find uh, pointing to Christian keeping of Sunday is the so-called Epistle of Barnabas. Now, it is not the real Barnabas that we read about in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Uh, this is pseudo-Barnabas. It's a pseudepigraphon. It's uh, falsely attributed to him but it was written apparently by somebody in Alexandria in Egypt where the tendency was to spiritualize everything. And that's what this epistle of Barnabas does. It doesn't take anything literally. Barnabas believes that the Hebrew scriptures is a gift to those who truly understand it. But he thinks the ones who understand it will not take it literally, but will understand it in a metaphorical or spiritual sense. 
Barnabas claims that he and his followers are observing the eighth day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, obviously Sunday. He condemns Judaism and everything associated with it, including observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath. The Barnabas letter is the first evidence of Sunday being promoted as the Christian day of worship. But to find the real heart of the pro-Sunday movement, we have to shift our focus from Alexandria westward to the heart of the Roman Empire. It is in ancient Rome that we find the first description of early Christian Sunday keeping. It comes from Justin Martyr, a convert to the new faith. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world. And Jesus Christ, our Savior on the same day, rose from the dead. Early Christian Sunday keepers needed a theological justification for keeping the first day of the week, and they found it in linking the, the first day to the first day of creation. In doing that, they were denying the authority of Christ, who declared himself to be Lord of the Sabbath, the seventh day of creation week. We have reached a critical defining moment in our story. By isolating the weekly holy day from its biblical roots, church leaders cut off the Sabbath from its source of spiritual meaning. It would become a hollow formality, a political hot potato, a test of authority, and a pawn in a centuries-long power struggle. Sunday was an attractive replacement for Sabbath because Sunday was beginning to draw to itself a certain amount of aura because of new developments in the pagan religion that made Sunday the day of worshiping the sun and thinking of the sun. I suppose it was inevitable that elements of pagan worship would find their way into Christianity. Christians were, after all, a small minority in a distinctly pagan world, a world that worshiped mythical gods, dead emperors, and the invincible sun. Historians commonly date the beginning of the Roman Empire as 31 BC. That's when Octavian defeated the forces of Antony and Cleopatra and came back to Rome to rule as the first Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And it was at that time that he shipped back to Rome two great obelisks. One of those he set up in the Circus Maximus. You know, it was not only that it was dedicated to the sun god, but it was also a very visible sign that Rome had conquered Egypt, that the dedication on it said, Caesar Augustus, dedicates this as a gift to the sun, but it also says, because Egypt has been conquered. And so the people who came to the Circus Maximus to watch the games could see not only this dedication to the sun, but also the realization that the Roman sun god had prevailed over the Egyptian sun god. Reports from the mid-first century provide additional evidence of the popularity of sun worship. The notorious Emperor Nero commissioned a sculptor to create a statue nearly 115 feet tall, topped with the likeness of his own head in the style of the sun god. When Vespasian built his great amphitheater, which we call today the Colosseum, he took that enormous colossus, colossus is the ancient word for statue, that enormous colossus of Nero, changed the features on the face, and dedicated it to the sun god. Emperor Elagabalus was so devoted to his eastern sun god that he took the deity's name. He brought his god in the form of a black meteorite all the way from Syria to Rome and adopted an eastern lifestyle. And so his eastern dress and his eastern orgies and his eastern behavior uh, brought Elagabalus to grief after four years. And even though his god was sent back, 
the black stone was shipped back to Syria. That sun worship continued. The ancient historian Plutarch reports how the Roman general Pompey went to the Eastern Mediterranean to deal with a problem of pirates attacking commercial shipping. This is about 50 BC. Well, he conquered the pirates, captured them, brought them back to Rome. Turns out the pirates were worshipers of Mithras, the sun god. And from those pirates, the worship of Mithras became very popular in Rome, especially among the military. I think that Roman military men would find Mithras a particularly attractive divinity. He was a warrior himself, fighting for the forces of good. It was a hierarchical religion, and one could progress from grade to grade. There were seven grades of Mithraism, much like in an army. And thirdly, it was a religion of brotherhood and fellowship. They would meet together not only to worship their god, but to eat a meal in common. We hear about Roman soldiers having come back from the east who pray at dawn, facing the east, facing the sun. And this is when we begin to get in Rome a mention of Deus Sol Invictus. That is to say, the unconquerable sun god. Unconquerable because the night tries to conquer the sun in each 24-hour period. But at dawn, the sun has survived. The sun has vanquished the night. The importance of sun-worshipping cults in the Roman Empire is shown during the reign of Aurelian, who was emperor from 270 to 275 AD. He established a state religion that included the worship of both the emperor and Sol Invictus, the invincible sun. He tried to unify all religions under the sun god. Diocletian, who came to power in 284, was also devoted to the sun god. He maintained Aurelian's principle of a state religion and even declared himself to be a god. Eventually, he ordered the persecution of Christians. To some Christian leaders, it made sense to take advantage of the popularity of Sunday, especially since Sunday observance would make Christianity more attractive to the pagans who already worshipped the sun on that day. For example, the Roman Emperor Constantine was, like Aurelian and Diocletian before him, a worshipper of the sun. He was the first emperor to profess belief in Christianity. It was during a crusade against his rivals that he was supposedly converted to Christianity. Sympathetic biographers claim that before a climactic battle near Rome, Constantine saw a vision of a flaming cross in the sky. He credited this vision with his subsequent victory and declared himself to be a Christian. Historians debate whether or not Constantine's conversion was genuine since he maintained his pagan superstitions throughout much of his reign. He consented to baptism only as he lay on his deathbed. Still, his reign did mark a dramatic turning point in the history of Christianity. In 313, with the agreement of his co-emperor Licinius, he effectively legalized the Christian religion. The reign of Constantine the Great forms one of the epochs in the history of the world. It is the era of the dissolution of the Roman Empire, the commencement, or rather consolidation, of a kind of Eastern despotism with a new capital, a new constitution, and finally, a new religion. Was Constantine converted to Christianity or was it the other way around? Who knows? But what's important to us today is that what emerged was a different kind of church, a different kind of state. In fact, the two were so blended together, it was hard to see where one ended and the other began. It seems that Constantine's personal religion was a mixture of Mithraic sun worship and Christianity. According to his Christian biographer, Eusebius, he taught all his armies to zealously honor the Lord's Day, Sunday, referring to it as the day of light and of the sun distinctly pagan terminology. Take a look at this passage from his famous Sunday Law of A.D. 321. On the venerable day of the sun, 
Let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits. The first law requiring people to celebrate on Sunday and rest on Sunday was uh, a law promulgated by the Emperor Constantine in the year 321. And he does it without any reference to Christian theology or Christian ideas. He's, he says to abstain from uh, labor on the venerable day of the sun, which is an allusion to the fact that uh, sun was becoming more and more the object of worship. So the first Sunday law requiring people to keep Sunday had no Christian flavor at all. Although Constantine promoted Christianity and built many, many Christian churches, he closed very few pagan temples. And we have a Roman calendar from the year 354. That's about 17 years after the death of Constantine, which has four separate festivals each year to the sun god. It shows that the sun god survived not only Constantine, but into the reigns of his immediate successors. The Constantine Sunday Law settled the Saturday-Sunday issue, not according to the records from the ancient city of Laodicea, where church leaders met near the middle of the fourth century. The church council at Laodicea dealt specifically with the issue of what scriptures, if, if any, should be read at Sabbath services. The Gospels are to be read on the Sabbath, that is, Saturday, with the other scriptures. The fact that the council addressed this issue is irrefutable proof that Christian church members were still attending worship services on the seventh day Sabbath. Remember, this is more than 300 years after Christ. But there's more. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. And if they can, resting then as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. What did the council mean by Judaizers? Judaizers were those Christians who did not work on Sabbath like the Jews. Church leaders wanted everyone to work on Sabbath and to refrain from work on the first day of the week, which they now called the Lord's Day. And this was consistent with the Sunday law enacted by the Emperor Constantine. In spite of the popularity of sun worship and the Sunday laws of emperors, many Christians continued to worship on the seventh day Sabbath. In fact, Christian churches that abandoned the Sabbath were in the minority. For although almost all churches throughout the world celebrate the sacred mysteries on the Sabbath of every week, yet the Christians of Alexandria and at Rome, on account of some ancient tradition, have ceased to do this. Without question, Christians were still observing the seventh-day Sabbath clear down in the second half of the fourth century. In spite of theological arguments, anti-Jewish prejudice, and the decree of an emperor, the Sabbath of the Creator was not dead. The succeeding centuries saw the Sabbath at the heart of controversy between popes and patriarchs. The weekly day of rest and worship became a test of church authority and a sign of submission to the sovereignty of a new kind of religious government. It became a major cause of the great rift that divided the Christian church for 900 years. More about that when we return with part three of the seventh day. <laughs>